today's episode of Vice Versa, we're talking about the Tesla Model S and X refresh. Tesla energy really starting to take off. President Biden taking more action on climate change and a really, really strange question that Elon Musk got asked during the er during the earnings call. As usual, I'm joined by Ricky Roy. So how are you doing, Ricky? And uh, what have you been up to this week? Good, good, man. It was a kind of a crazy week. I mentioned to you my M1 MacBook died, so I've been kind of scrambling to, to keep things going. So I don't have a channel video yet for my main channel, but I'm working on it. Um, otherwise, you know, find the good fight. How are you, how are you doing? What, what channels and videos have you done this week? Things have been pretty good. I uh, released a video this week on kind of green skyscrapers and green office buildings about some of the standards, like the lead standard and what that means and where the future of construction is going. Interesting stuff. Yeah, we'll, we'll put a card to it. Definitely check it out. It's a good video. I watched it uh, earlier today, actually. So shall we get into it? We got a yeah. fun, fun lineup, I think, today. Yeah. Biden ordering an end to the fossil fuel subsidies and promoting equity for underserved communities. And this one is, uh, he's, he's coming out swinging with a lot of different um, executive orders, which is kind of controversial because it's not passing things through law. It's just him kind of by, based on edict. But uh, this change makes a lot of, it's going to have a huge impact over the next few years. Because what it's done is he's basically rolled back all of the fossil fuel subsidies, which is about $20 billion a year in subsidies for the oil industry. And it breaks down to about 20% of that is going to coal and about 80% of that is going to natural gas and crude oil. And so by saying that he's going to dial those back, it basically is going to open up a lot more competition for renewables to kind of really start to take the light because solar is already cheaper in many ways, not across the board, but it's cheaper in many ways. And if suddenly you can't get the incentives that you normally can for fossil fuels. It's you're less likely to drill for new oil, less likely to uh, try to get more natural gas. And some of the statistics that came out of the article that I uh, am citing here that I thought was interesting was the direct subsidies that uh, fossil fuels typically get today are called intangible drilling cost deduction, percentage depletion, credit for clean oil investment, last in first out foreign tax credits, master limited partnerships there's all these crazy like convoluted laws and ways that you can report taxes and the way you can deduct losses that make it crazy profitable to keep going for no more natural gas and more uh oil and just by cutting these out it's going to be billions of dollars saved for taxpayers and it will also mean oil companies will be less likely to want to keep drilling so it's it's going to have a huge impact over the next few years yeah, I can imagine you you have a channel on clean energy, so you must get comments like I do about how the federal tax credit for EVs is BS and these cars can't stand on their own. But what people don't realize is oil companies, the most profitable companies historically, not anymore, but yeah. historically, have gotten subsidies for years, and no one seems to worry about that part of it. So um, to me, this seems like a long time coming. If we really want to talk about converting over, GM made this big announcement about being all EVs by 2035. If we want to see that happen, we have to have an even play, playing field. Um, what they do with federal tax credits for EVs, I think, will be uh, telling, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, and the second part is, you know, the government, <clears throat> especially local governments, were so quick to respond to EVs. You know, part of the way they fund road initiatives and, you know, repairing potholes and other infrastructure improvement is from the gasoline tax. So typically, depending on what state and city you live, here in California, we have the most ridiculously high taxes, but you have tax money that goes from gasoline to fund uh, road infrastructure. When you drive an EV and you charge it home and you, you supercharge, what do you, how do you pay for that? They were quick to figure that out. A yeah. lot of, a lot of states have in, in, you know, put in road taxes that you pay, like when you register your car. So it shows the government can do things when they want to. So let's hope that this is, you know, the pendulum swing the other way a little bit and a little more equity in that regard. Absolutely. Do you want to take the next one? Sure. So the next one um, sounds incredibly awesome. Um, I have a couple of reservations, and I just, and we'll we'll get to that. But Biden has announced that he will make the entire U.S. federal fleet of about six hundred and fifty six hundred forty five thousand vehicles electric. This has um, been pretty vague. There aren't like exact timetables. There aren't really um, mentions of which companies it'll be and stuff. Like for example, Workhorse, which is a truck maker and EV truck maker startup. They were hoping to, 
to you know get that bid, but negotiations have kind of stalled. Um, so it's largely without teeth at this point, but he's showing you where he's think what he's thinking about and where they want to go. And um, this should be good news for anybody who's into EVs. But my caveat, my two takeaways, I'm curious how you feel about this, is you know I'm a firm believer in um, in being financially responsible with taxpayer money. So mm -hmm. my first point is like, if we needed 600,000 cars, I'm hoping that they reevaluate and figure, can we get more done with less cars? Can we cut down on spending? Because I think the, the deficit keeps me up at night. I have kids. What kind of a country is it going to be if we keep having runaway uh, inflation and deficits the way we have? So my hope is EVs last a long time. They charge really quickly. You don't need to, you don't need as much downtime. Can we do more with less and buy less vehicles? Can we cut that number down? And secondly, I hope this doesn't become a good old boys club where they're okay. buying all these cars from GM. <laughs> if you've ever been to a car rental, you see the, the worst cars in the world, like the Chrysler 200, a car that nobody should have. And no one does have. No one buys them, really. They're all fleet cars. They just sell them by the volume to car companies that rent them out, rental companies like Avis and Budget. So my hope is it doesn't go down that rabbit hole. We don't play favorites or have any of that kind of stuff. I hope the government just says, we need cars. We believe EVs will be cleaner and safer and more economically viable. Like, let's hope that the budget committees in 10 years kind of go, remember that all that talk about going EV? Here's how much money it has saved us in 10 years. And that will be, that's what I'm hoping for. And that'll be just the, the, the cherry on top. Yeah, that was the thing I was going to bring up about the story was, I hope it's not a good old boy, boys club because you know, the initial thought was that means Ford and GM, those kind of companies are going to be the ones that are going to reap the benefits of this. Probably not Tesla, but then again, there are police, you know, across the country that have been buying Teslas for their fleet and have been saving huge amounts of taxpayer money on Tesla police cars. And so it's like, they're kind of a litmus test that could be used to sell Teslas <laughs> for the federal government. So it's, I do think it's probably going to be Ford, GM, Workhorse. The Workhorse stock was up like 10% after the announcement of this. So it's like everybody's already looking at the, the standard players in the market for this kind of a thing. But it's yeah, it's going exactly. to be interesting to see how this rolls out. It's going to be a few years before we really see this start to kind of have any kind of traction. Yeah. Shout out to John Check, who just did a $5 super chat. He says, Biden's going to buy a fleet of Tesla government vehicles, cyber trucks with machine guns mounted for the military. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, you know... <laughs> Five years from now, we're, we're kind of joking about that. But five years from now, I think just the ROI on EVs, all the potential from an electric platform, it'll be very interesting. So we shall see. Yeah. So why don't you take the next one as well, which is the big one of the night. This is the one that everybody's talking about. We're going to talk about it for a while, too. There's a, so much to talk about coming out of the uh, quarterly call yesterday. Yeah, it, it, what's, <laughs> what's funny, the article that we... Um, the article that we have talks about the most, yeah, here's here's the link to the article. Um, <clears throat> of all the cool stuff that they introduced with the new refresh model S and X, why start with the the steering wheel, which to me is polarizing? But I think Tesla goes for that. They love polarizing stuff. They love debate. They love getting people fired up. But I, I'm, I'm torn, but I like this thing. Tell me you don't want to be driving around with like a fighter plane yoke in front of you. That That's going to be cool. Is it practical? Is it going to be like day-to-day -day livable? We shall see. <laughs> yeah. Steering wheels can be changed out. Uh, they're not permanent. And there are no more stocks and stuff on the car. So it'll be, um, it'll be interesting. But overall, the big picture with what they've done here, I think is absolutely brilliant. It's actually the video that I'm making that will be airing tomorrow is going to be why this refresh they've done is genius. But boiling it down without giving too much away, what they've done here is what I would call a low CapEx refresh, meaning they didn't spend a bunch of capital to do this. Uh, the average car, when you refresh it, the cost is between $1 billion and $6 billion. $1 billion if you're just doing some fascia changes and stuff and some body panels, but the, the platform is the same. And that number goes to $6 billion if you're building a brand new platform. So what Tesla has done, and it's a testament to how brilliant this car was back in 2012, the, the, in the case of the S in 2015, in the case of the X. But they were able to take these platforms build upon them, update them, refresh, and look at that interior. There's a new screen in the front. There's a new screen in the back. They mentioned that the computing, the compute engine for the, the gaming <laughs> is a 10 teraflop uh, CPU processor GPU uh, system on a chip. So I'm thinking like that, we're talking like, you know, PlayStation 5 levels of power. So does that mean this is MCU 3, the third iteration of their, of their media control software? 
We shall see. Or maybe it's MCU 2 plus a gaming component or something. But anyways, really fascinating stuff. And this is a look at the future. We have the landscape screen. We have controls in the back now for people. If you have kids, they have a little 8-inch screen back there. Um, so I was surprised here it's only 8 inches because the, the front screen in the front is 17. And the one in front of the driver is 12 inches. Those are massive screens. They're supposed to be really high resolution and um, good click feedback. And the general layout, I think, is beautiful. They have the wraparound console and the wood or the, you know, the trim all around the front. They have the Model 3 and Y style vent system, which is just such a clean look. The look of a dial or a vent to me on a car now just seems dated. Mercedes has these round, very posh looking. But even to me, that just looks really antiquated now. That is the future of what an HVAC system should look like. And I was blown away. What, what did you, what was your takeaway from this? My first thought was when this came up was this is gorgeous. I think this is just an absolutely spectacular interior. To go to the steering wheel though, I'm definitely in the camp of what are they thinking? I really am in that that camp. That is so not a practical steering wheel. And I've heard the comments of, well, this isn't meant to be a full self-driving car. You're probably not going to be using it that much. And my response to that is that much. It's like for right now, full self-driving doesn't exist. It's not a real thing yet. It's still in beta. We're still year two, three or more years away for, before it's a real thing that you can rely on in every state and every country around the world. It's like, we're still a ways away from that. So people are still going to be driving these things by hand a lot, especially around your, you know, parking lots and things like that. People are probably going to want to do that themselves. And then if you're wanting to do a little sporty driving, you're going to want to be like taking control of the car and really enjoying that, you know, 1.9 second zero to 60 time that they've got. It's insane that they have this steering wheel that is going to be so unpleasant to like if you have to do a multi-turn on that thing it's going to suck <laughs> there's, there's, i am i'm not crazy about that steering wheel at all i think it's they're i think they're pushing the envelope in so many ways in such good ways but in areas like that i think you're, you're they're pushing it just a little too soon it's like if full self-driving was here right now not in beta and it was available everywhere and they came out with this, I'd be like, that's great. I, you know, that's awesome because you're not going to be driving it most of the time. But for these cars being sold today, you're still going to be having to drive it a lot. And it just seems odd. The other thing, the lack of stocks, um, as a user interface designer, <laughs> that really got to me because it's like th they're, they're leaning into the AI deciding, oh, we think you want to go forward. So they're just going to automatically put you into drive when you hit the brake to start the car. Or it's going to detect you're in your garage and you're near a wall. So it means, oh, we, we think you're going to want to back up. So it'll put you in reverse automatically. That's how the system is going to be working, which to me is, again, insane that that is the default mode. But evidently, there are going to be like park, drive, reverse, kind of touch sensitive buttons along the front edge of the charging area. Cause I don't know if you can see it in the image. There's a hazards, uh, like right in between the, right in between the phones, right at the bottom, you can see a little hazard button for putting your hazards on. Evidently down there, you're going to be able to touch or do something down there as well to put yourself into drive. So there will be some kind of tactile feedback style touch button that you can push. Um, but it just feels like they're pushing the envelopes in good ways in most of this. But in that one area, I just have serious doubts that that's going to get wide adoption from a lot of people. But everything else about this refresh, it is was desperately needed. It's standardized their design language of the UI for all of the, the cars. And I love that the... Um, the hint of this image that you're looking at right here is an app store. It's like this is hinting at some kind of app store in the new UI. It's like I cannot wait for the software update to come out to all the Model 3s, Model Ys, these new cars. It looks like it's going to be a really cool interface. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, I was thinking about your video on the Cybertruck when it first came out and you were talking about kind of being a little bit shocking and how that could be a good thing. And I that the the steering wheel design, I think, uh, harkens a little bit to that. I think yeah. Tesla yeah. does push the envelope hard. And the beautiful thing about having that big screen is on a future ver version, if they realize, you know what, people don't like this, they want buttons, 
they could easily have all the drive controls that pop out when you have your foot on the brake and you can change it and stuff like the beauty of having a big screen and legally the only real button i can think of that you have to have physical is the hazard button that can't mm-hmm. be software so yeah. they still have that and they'll be fine and, I, and this is a joke but i was thinking you know when you go zero to 60 in under two seconds i think the faa does legally classify you as an as an airplane so <laughs> <laughs> the steering wheel might actually make make sense there <laughs> Definitely, definitely uh, quirky, but uh, really interesting. And also, they've broken down the Plaid um, moniker into two models. There's the Plaid and the Plaid Plus. What's interesting there is I think the Plaid will be pretty much kind of the current car with the 18650 cells plus the tri-motor configuration, whereas the Plaid Plus is the hotness. It'll be the, the car that comes at the end of the year with the 4680s, and it'll be all the latest and greatest with that extra range and everything else. But by doing it this way, they can launch a Plaid car around the time Lucid Motors is coming out with the Air, which was kind of, I think, their target. They were trying to basically like outdo them. And so they'll have a car short term, and then they've got their Halo car coming eventually at the end of the year with the new stuff. And I think in terms of managing the supply chain of their cells, brilliant move. Yeah. Yeah. This to me this is also a kind of it's not a nail in the coffin for Lucid, but like this is this is going straight up against Lucid to me. It's like this is perfectly perfectly tailored as a response to me. Yeah. It was it was a responsible uh response as well. The car outside is largely unchanged. They didn't actually that's what I mentioned the low cap X refresh. They mm-hmm. didn't really have they didn't go full speed ahead. You some of those renders that we've been looking at all week some of these beautiful new designs for the S, none of that happened. And I, at first I was kind of bummed out. I was like, I was really hoping for a new refresh. But from a business perspective, what they did is very smart. They're still a small company and they don't even have a full lineup yet. They need that pickup truck and a van eventually and all this other stuff. So they're better served to build those lines out rather than refreshing a car like the S and the X, which are lower volume to begin with. So smart, smart way to approach it. And um, definitely different than Lucid, but they've got and it shows you how quickly they can res- respond to a to a competitor, right? What an amazing, amazing thing to see. Yeah, absolutely. Well, to jump to the next story, which is building off of the whole Q4, Q, uh, Q4 announcement, um, Tesla Energy's massive quarter accelerates drive to decentralized electric utility. Basically, Tesla Energy is kind of starting to catch on fire a little bit. It was... For the, a few years ago, it dropped. Actually, let me pull up hypercharts. There's some great hypercharts here. Um, you can kind of see here's the solar uh, deployments over the past, you know, X number of years. And you can see it dropped dramatically. And then it's been kind of like leveled off at this very low level. And here's Q4 at the very end with a massive spike. So it's starting its way back up again after being kind of starved for the past few years while the car side of the business really took all the focus. And Elon's been saying on these calls, Tesla Energy is kind of the sleeping giant. Tesla Energy is going to really start to take off. Solar roof is going to be a huge thing. And to me, this is the sign that that is starting to happen, that they're starting to kind of turn that ship and kind of put it in the right direction right now. Um, some of the stats that I thought were fascinating that came out were 86 megawatts of solar was deployed during that quarter which is a 59% increase year over year. And there was 29 megawatt increase quarter over quarter. That's such a dramatic uptick. Um, The solar roof deployments are really increasing, they said. And I've anecdotally been hearing this from a lot of people. Since I put out my solar roof video, I've had quite a few people reach out to me saying they just had it installed or they're getting it installed next month. And like, it really does seem like they're starting to ramp up installations of the solar roof which is another very exciting aspect of this. And then the last part was 1,584 kilowatt hours of storage was installed in Q4, which is a 200% year over year increase, 100% increase quarter over quarter. That is that is astonishing that it's that yeah. big of an increase. Just absolutely That's shocking. a shocking one. Yeah. yeah. So like if, if you're looking at like an S curve growth pattern, if this does do that, this is just the beginning of that growth. Exactly. So I was, you hit on the head. I was going to mention the solar growth is, is brilliant, but the power wall and mega pack uh, rollout, staggering. Mm-hmm. And it makes you think, you know, it wasn't long ago they had 
they were self starved. They couldn't make enough cars. And now they're they've sold a record number of cars and a record number of mega packs yeah. and power walls. So, yeah. And I've seen a lot more power wall videos on YouTube. So people are getting them. I can tell. Yeah. Um, and I think this gets to the bigger strategy of how they're rolling out some of this growth. So this isn't possible if they don't have Gigafactory Shanghai, if they don't have CATL and other partners providing batteries for them for their cars. Like for example, if it, if it took Gigafactory 2170 cells to make Giga Shanghai Chinese uh, Model 3s, that would come at the cost of building more Chinese uh, Model 3s here for the for the states in North America. So what they're doing, I think, is, is, is such a smart move. They, and Elon mentioned, if we build our own batteries, it's not because we're trying to get out of the game of buying from other people. They basically have like an outstanding call. If you make batteries, we want them. As many as you can make, we want them. Like we'll, we'll keep buying them because their entire business runs on this and this will be the limiting factor for them. So they've done a good job of, of this rollout. And when you talk about Giga Austin making 4680s and Cybertrucks, I mean, you can, these numbers might double and triple and quadruple and 10x in the next two, three years. So really yeah. exciting stuff. Well, the very last thing that we're going to just kind of touch on at the end, I'll just take this one really quick. And this one's kind of goofy. Um, right near the end of the call, one of the questions he was asked was he had originally had said once they got kind of an affordable car made, he would not be CEO anymore and he would just become like the lead designer. Um, and somebody basically asked him, is that going to take place? Because there's a lot of stuff at play right now. And his response was, I expect to be CEO of Tesla for several years. So I think there's still a lot that I'm super excited about and doing, and I think it would be hard to leave. I just thought this was an odd question to ask him. He laughed about it when he was asked. And part of the reason I thought it was just kind of a funny question to ask him was like, it almost came across as, are you trying to get kind of a juicy headline of Elon Musk says he's going to leave in two years? Or was it just a genuine curiosity, like have things changed for him? Because he originally said this, you know, like a decade ago, does that still hold true today? And my takeaway is he's still far too engaged in what he's doing. And even though he said he's there for at least a few more years, I would not be surprised if a few more years, there's other stuff they're playing on doing and integrating with different companies that he's still so engaged, he doesn't want to step away. So I don't see him obviously being there forever. He's, he's going to have to step away at some point because he's got other passion projects, but I don't see him leaving Tesla for years. It's like, it just seems like there's way too much to do. It's funny. You mentioned it. It sounded like a weird question to get. I actually, when I, when I was on the call and I was listening, I kind of felt like it was a plant. Like he wanted the <laughs> question asked. And so I'm mean, hearing me out. Here's, here's the reason why I say that is, um, because I mentioned that because the way he answered it was very telling. First he says, yeah, you know, nobody's a CEO forever. Um, but there's still a lot to do. We're not at the $20,000 car yet. Globally, EV sales are not even 1%. So we're just getting started. So first, I think he kind of laid out expectations and progress and where they are and that they are really, really still pretty early. But the second part, he says, you know, I'd like to have a life at some point. I have no, no, I have no, I'm not doing anything. I work all day. I wake up and I go to work and I go to bed. I work. I've had periods of my life like that when I, uh, Trans, uh, when I moved from a engineer to being a, into software, I'd come home and like I teach myself. I remember those days. It was grinding, and it comes at a great cost when you don't see your friends or your family. Like you're missing stuff, and you're saying, "Nope, can't make it. I got this to do." So, the reason I think he brings this up clearly, he's not going anywhere for for years, for several years. But he brings this up because I think what he's worried about now is. People aren't even fans of Tesla. They're fans of Elon. And that's a very dangerous thing for a company. This mm -hmm. is not some backyard mom and pop shop. This is a publicly traded $800 billion company. One day he will be gone. And what does Tesla look like? I wouldn't be surprised if some some of the magic isn't gone when he leaves. Like Apple has never been the same company after Steve Jobs. They make a lot of money by printing phones. And Tim Cook is very much like a, a bean counter. And he he's done fine on the, on the stock side. But the magic to me is not the same as when with Jobs was around. Um, it'll be the same thing here. So let's say the number is five years. In five years, we have Cybertruck and Semi and Roadsters, and we have 10 and, 10 and 15, 20% of cars or EVs or 25%, whatever it is, 50%. And at that point, he says, look, I'm going to go back to my life, plus maybe SpaceX and other parts of my... I, I never see him as like a stay-at-home dad sitting at home like watching TV. He's always going to be grinding and working. 
But I think at some point he's going to be tired of Tesla and he'll want to do more on the SpaceX side or he'll want to do some other, who knows, Neuralink. Maybe he'll spend all day and night obsessing about Neuralink, right, in five years. Yeah. So when that happens, he doesn't want to see his company tank and he doesn't want people to think of Tesla as Elon. He wants him to, people to see Tesla as Tesla run by Elon today, but in the future, somebody else. So I, I kind of felt like he was setting the stage for the eventual and uh, probably pretty smart to start thinking of it like that because he's not going to be CEO forever. Well, it's it's interesting you bring up Apple because I disagree with you a little bit. They Apple did lose a little bit of their mojo with Steve Jobs left. But one thing Steve Jobs recognized was the same thing. It's like it was he was a cult personality and Apple could not be Jobs. Apple had to be Apple. So it, they figured out what the DNA of what made Apple Apple and created Apple University, put all of their executives through this special training about here's how Apple works, thinks, and approaches problems and products. And they established kind of a methodology of how people should think about this stuff. And it's so ingrained into their DNA now that when Steve Jobs is gone, yeah, they're, you know, it's, they lost their best guitarist and it's like they're having to find a new guitarist, but it's, it's. It, they didn't go so far off the rails. It they, they grew more under, you know, they grew more in the time that Steve Jobs was gone than they did with Steve Jobs. So they've been doing just fine. So Elon basically has to do the same thing. He has to come up with a solid succession plan. Who's going to be the person that steps in as he steps away? Are they going to set up something similar where there's like a, a Tesla university where, you know, first principles thinking is their mantra and it gets hammered into everybody's head so they never, ever turn into the GMs or the Fords of the world. They're always the one that's questioning everything and taking things from a first principles approach. It's like, I would assume that they're going to try to do something like that. I just hope they do it. It's like, I just, you know what I mean? It's like, I hope it's not hope. I hope it's a reality. I want to see what their succession plan is. It's a very great point. Very great point with Apple and Apple University. Yeah, you have to. You basically have to squeeze that essence out of these brilliant people yes. and find a way for normal, non-brilliant people to to toe that line. That's the, that's the thing. Really, it, it always comes down to. So, um, really, yeah, great point. Great point. Yeah, I have a mixed feeling of Apple lately. Um, we can yeah. talk about that on another day. <laughs> I, was, I, was say, I understand <laughs> why you do. I totally understand why you do. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, there's a company outside of Elon, and I think. The thought of that, actually, as I was saying it out loud, I was thinking to myself, holy crap, Elon won't be a... It's hard to hard to take and hard to imagine. So yep. you got to start to think about it years ahead of time. Yep. And uh, thanks so much for everybody for watching and listening. And if you think you've learned it, be sure to uh, subscribe and watch us live every Thursday night at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, or listen on the go by subscribing to the podcast at viceversa.show. And if you would be really helpful, if you could also give the podcast a rating and a review on your podcast platform of choice, because it really does help. Thanks to everyone again, and we'll see you in the next one.